Okay, here we go. Um, this is where I left off yesterday. I wanted to touch on this again because I said, the, said some things and I kind of assumed everyone would know what I'm talking about um, and I just want to make sure. So when, as soon as we say with inter intranets and extranets, we're saying calling it a private network, what does that imply? What's necessary? If I'm going to secure my network, what's required? Again, think Blackboard. What do you do to get into Blackboard? Log in, right? Okay. But let's be precise. We authenticate. Okay. We authenticate. And when we authenticate with our username and password, the system identifies us. And once it identifies us, it provides us with authorized access to resources based on our identity. Okay. And we're, we're getting to this. I think in another two weeks, we hit security. Um, but if I say it like 10 times before then, everybody will have it. Um, so, intranets and extranets security through authentication, okay, and identification. Virtual private networks, a VPN is a tunneling protocol. So essentially what it does is it creates a path, an encrypted path or an encrypted communications channel through the internet or whatever network end to end. So as soon as I say encryption, we need to, of course, distinguish between symmetric and asymmetric. VPNs use symmetric or private key encryption. Symmetric means that the same key is used to encrypt the data as is used to unencrypt it. And this works well if, of course, the end-to-end -end stations have a relationship with each other. So you look at organizations with Salesforce. I'm sending salespeople out. They're going to connect to my servers using a VPN. Well, before I send them out, of course, I can give them the password because I have that relationship. This is the same thing that takes place with our personal Wi-Fi routers in our home, right? We put a password on the router, and then to log into our router on our machines, we'll have a password as well. We have a relationship with ourselves. I, have, I control both devices, so I can put the same password on. So symmetric private key encryption works when the parties have a relationship, they know each other. Um, but this doesn't work in all cases. Because what, what about, say, Amazon.com? Amazon cannot have a relationship with every one of its customers. Can't do it. It wouldn't be secure. Okay, If it starts handing out keys, anyone can get that key and along the line intercept the communications and get someone's credit card. So for e-commerce, HTTPS, secure HTTP, we're, we're using public key encryption. Public key is asymmetric, so one key is used to encrypt the data, and a different key and algorithm is used to unencrypt it, okay, or, or recover it. So what Amazon can do, of course, is you're making a purchase from Amazon, HTTPS, you're provided with a public key, so your computer will encrypt the data, but only Amazon has that key, that reflexive key, so to speak, that will unencrypt it, okay, that asymmetric key. So um, the difference between symmetric and asymmetric. Okay, now I moved some slides around yesterday just, just to confuse myself, so we already covered this. Um, because I did add, one of the things I mentioned yesterday, um, the text did not have the ring topology, and I wanted to make sure that we covered this, or at least I did present it. So here's the ring network, okay? And again, we can assess this for quality of service, security, scalability, all of these things. Um, fault tolerance, of course, well, if I sever the ring, I stop communications. So several things like the fiber distributed data interface, and this was what was used on the space station, has dual rings, counter rotating rings, okay, that move in opposite directions. Because then if there's a sever, of course, things can just be routed back. So even with a sink, if you cut a wire, a single wire, you can still have communications between all parties. Rings do require additional protocols. How do you govern who gets to transmit? Quite often, this is done with a token. So quite often, you'll see almost inseparably linked, you'll hear about a token ring, OK? A token is just a small software token that will be passed from computer to computer. And when the computer has that token, it can transmit. So you can imagine if this station has the token it's transmitting, sends its communications off, well, the last thing it's going to send because it's done with its communications is the token. It will pass the token off to the next device. So the next device can communicate. And typically, the token will have a time limit as well. So a computer cannot just grab the token and keep it, OK? So you can see 
that this can provide guaranteed bandwidth on, depending on how you set the token, which was one of the reasons it was used on the space station. Because now we're talking about real-time computing. Real-time computing, there are things that have to occur. Okay, we look at say robotics. You look at you know autonomous vehicles. You know driving along and there's a wall in front. Well, something has to happen. It has to either stop or turn. Okay, so this real-time communications, this exchange of data has to take place. And if you're going to do that, you have to have a network that will support real-time communications. Okay, so now looking at wired media. For last time, I'll state, you know, we follow what the textbook states, but fiber optic cable is not a wired. Um, <clears throat> when we look at twisted pair and coaxial, again, when I, when I introduced bandwidth, I gave you an alternative definition and really a correct definition for, for bandwidth. It's the inherent capacity of the media. Coaxial cable, because it's much thicker, has a higher capacity, a higher inherent bandwidth than twisted pair. Twisted pair, again, is our phone lines, our traditional phone lines, although it's used typically throughout buildings for Ethernet, okay? Coaxial cable, you know, the cable we get for our cable television, is both expensive, it's also very hard to work with. You, you, we all are pretty familiar now with the BTC here, the, the building we're in, and imagine pulling coaxial cable through the, the ceilings and all this. It is hard to move. Whereas telephone cable, that small flexible cable, is real easy to pull through ceilings or subfloors. Um, and twisted pair cable has great bandwidth for ethernet. We're gonna see ethernet um, communications, you know, even up to 40 gigabits a second now. They keep pushing it higher and higher. Uh, but as I presented yesterday, Time Warner will always be a step ahead of DSL because the inherent capacity of that coaxial cable is much greater than twisted pair. Now, a note on twisted pair, of course, you know, implicit in its name, it's a pair of cables. With each single cable, we'll have the wires spun in one direction, but then the two pairs will be spun together in the opposite direction. And this serves to at least minimize or decrease the radio frequency interference, the RFI, and the electromagnetic interference, the, the EMI, okay? And again, we start assessing just the media for quality of service, security, scalability, all these things. Um, so if I look at the two copper medias, twisted pair and coaxial, well, again, I have an induced current. I have a current running on them, which means they're generating RFI EMI, and you can detect this. So you don't even have to tap the cable and you can eavesdrop, okay? Now you do need some, you know, sophisticated, you don't even actually need sophisticated equipment depending on how close you are to the cable. You know, if you're the CIA, FBI, you can do this at quite a distance. Um, you know, for the general, general Joe, you have to be adjacent to it. Um, tapping, so now we, if we look at both scalability and security of copper cable, it is relatively easy to tap twisted pair and coaxial cable. Okay, if I'm not adding a station, well, if I just insert something metal, I can detect the state of the line. I can read what's on it. And with copper cable, the end stations won't be wary of that. Okay, I can stick a needle into, you know, I better be grounded and things like that, but I can stick a needle into copper cable and detect its line state, and the end stations really aren't aware. In contrast to fiber optic, fiber optic, of course, is photons, it's light. I cannot just stick something in there and read it, okay? Because as soon as I do that, I'm going to interfere with it. In fact, I'm going to break it. The end stations are gonna be aware. If I try to tap into fiber optic cable, what I actually have to do is sever it, put in a kind of a junction and retransmit the signal. And of course, as soon as I do that, the end stations will detect that their signal has been lost and they will understand that maybe, well, either the, the uh, media has failed or someone's trying to break in. Either way, I'm gonna get noticed that something is happening. <clears throat> Okay, so here's the pictorial, uh, pictures of them. Um, and in a minute, we will start talking about standards. And we will talk about standards in many areas. Standards are important, and they run throughout CIS, computer science. In networking, of course, it's very easy. You know, we have, we have standard protocols. We have standard physical connectors, okay? You would not be happy if you bought a Wi-Fi router and you came home and you tried to connect your Ethernet and they didn't use those RJ45 connectors. Okay, 
they use something other than that. Um, you wouldn't be, and similarly, just in a general sense, you wouldn't be happy to go to Target and buy a toaster and come home and find something other than a two-prong or a three-prong plug at the end, right? We need standards for interoperability. Um, so this is this is germane to computer science and electronics. Okay, so wireless. Okay, wireless. You know they're saying this this is the future. We're seeing, you know, magnetic induction for charging, just even charging um, batteries. We're transmitting our media. You look at the newer MacBook Pros. You know they don't even have an Ethernet port. You actually have to buy an adapter that goes from the Thunderbolt port to the Ethernet port. Of course, you have to pay Apple handsomely for this, this privilege. Um, again, you know my, my concerns about the health, the health concerns of the wireless spectrum. Um, so when we do talk about wireless, and really, you know, we're looking at high-speed wireless. So we're looking at cellular communications, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, things of this nature. We are looking at the microwave spectrum, you know, 300 megahertz to, to 3 gigahertz, so to speak. Um, <coughs> So, or 300 gigahertz, excuse me. Um, so there's the Wi-Fi spectrum. Um, and again, we know that the higher the frequency, the more inherent capacity or bandwidth it's going to have, because there are more transitions, right? You know, five gigahertz, five billion cycles per second is twice as much as 2.4. Because of the additional cycles per second, I can put more data. I can encode more data there. And we've seen this, you know, just in cell phone signals as we go from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G. We keep using higher and higher frequencies, okay? And there's, there's something there, too. Um, I'm not going to say almost anything about cellular. Probably everyone in this room knows more about cellular than me. Um, we understand that our calls are transferred. They migrate with us from cell tower to cell tower. Okay, um, and they're controlled by the mobile telephone switching office that controls us, you know, controls our communications as we move, move around. So we know that. Um, <clears throat> we know that microwave and satellite transmissions require line of sight. Okay, so with that, satellite transmissions, of course, are going to have much greater coverage just because they're in a geosynchronous orbit above the Earth. So their coverage is going to be much greater. So hence, you know, we can get away with, I think, what is it, 14 GPS satellites. Um, when you contrast with that with how many cellular uh, towers we have, um, it really puts it into perspective. Um, <clears throat> so I won't say much about that. Infrared or infrared, however you want to pronounce it. Um, of course, of course, uses the infrared spectrum. Um, and devices are still being created, you know, fewer and fewer. Um, you know, we're controlling our TVs now via, you know, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth with our phones. Um, but you look at even the Apple TV. Apple TV, the Apple TV remote still uses infrared, um, which, you know, kind of annoys some people, but that's what it is. Um, it's cost effective. <coughs> so now... Let's recall what we have here. We have the messages, right? We have the medias, we have the, the mediums. Um, we have the devices and we have protocols. So we're gonna start looking at protocols. And I'm, we're gonna look at a legacy protocol as well. We're gonna look at carrier sense, multiple access, access de collision detect, because just it's going to help us with our programming. If we immerse ourselves into, we have to learn about the history of programming and communications because we may be able to extend this or it'll give us a grounding, a foundation to extend our knowledge. So we are going to look at that as well. So protocols are a set of rules. And I introduced this um, or gave you an example. We have this even with our phone conversations, right? Because, of course, the phone, whenever we have a connection, is a full duplex connection, okay, both ways concurrently at the same time if we want to do that. But courtesy, protocol, prevents us from both speaking at the same time, right? Because if everyone speaks, it's, it's more difficult to communicate that way. Probably people can do it. I'm going to give you another analogy um, <clears throat> that's maybe, maybe even more appropriate for the Internet. If we look at our highway system, our road system, this is actually analogous to the Internet, okay? The road system, of course, we have our highways, so we have, you know, similar to the backbone of the Internet. We have the infrastructure. We have devices, red light, green light, things like that. 
But we also have protocols, okay, that govern the way we drive, and we'll see that govern communications on the internet. We can take a red on red. We yield to oncoming traffic. We have rules of the road, right of way rules, things of this nature. So we operate with protocols every day in our daily lives. So it should be easy to see that we require these for our communications as well. Um, already presented standards, okay? And I did add that the textbook doesn't really talk about, um, when we talk about standards and networking, the two main bodies, there's IEEE, Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and there's the International Standards Organization. Actually, I think it's International Organization of Standards, but the, the acronym is ISO anyway. Um, and these will establish standards. So when we look at 802.3, you know, the Ethernet standard, 802.11, Wi-Fi. Wi uh, when we look at the RJ45 connector, you know, the banana connectors, things of this nature, they are governed or determined by IEEE. And again, we're going to see standards from this point forward. We're going to see when we get to the web, W3C standards. Um, so we're going to see a lot more. Um, and what do they provide for? Interoperability. And essentially, with interoperability, they provide us with a future-proof path. Okay? What I designed today can still be used tomorrow. Okay, so 802.3. This is the Ethernet standard. Okay? It is now used predominantly, most organizations use a STAR topology, and we saw why. STAR topologies provide a greater quality of service, okay, um, greater fault tolerance. All of these things are necessary, especially when we look at converged communications. We're looking at video conferencing, web conferencing, VoIP, things like this. I don't want to share a bus with someone when I need a high throughput or high bandwidth. Um, <clears throat> works with many different types of media, twisted pair, coaxial, fiber optic. Um, and again, we see the speeds are just continually being pushed up. But for understanding, to kind of ground us, let's take a look at the carrier sense, multiple access, collision detect protocol. Okay, so this was in use for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, because Ethernets were predominantly bus topologies. Even, even into the early 2000s. And, and you'll still find these out there, okay? So how do we govern communications if we have multiple devices sharing a common bus? Okay, now, <clears throat> again, I said protocols. Communication. Um, well, you know, two people can talk at the same time and they can probably listen, kind of listen to what the other person is saying, but that doesn't work in communications. Why? We have digital communications, ones and zeros. What happens if A starts transmitting ones and zeros and B starts transmitting ones and zeros and these ones and zeros meet? They're gonna corrupt each other, right? Because we are encoding the ones and zeros as high voltages or low voltages, right? So a high voltage, of course, is going to corrupt. They'll t turn a zero to a one, right? So completely corrupt the communications. So how do we do this? Well, each end station or host will sense, carrier sense on the line. Is there anything present on the line? How is it doing this? What is actually, what component of the computer is actually responsible for sensing if there's a signal out there? Okay. What card in the computer allows a computer to connect to a network? The NIC, the network interface card, right? The NIC, that also has the MAC address, the media access control address, and that's a physical address because we're going to need to distinguish between physical and logical addresses from this point forward. Okay, so each computer's NIC, okay? And the NIC, of course, will have, in this case, an external port, an Ethernet port. So the Ethernet cable is plugged in, and the NIC is detecting, carrier sense, is there anything out there? So, for example, Say computer A here and computer B both want to transmit. They're both going to transmit at the same time. Each one starts transmitting. They each do a carrier sense, but of course neither has started to transmit yet, so there's nothing there. Computer A and computer B start transmitting at the same time, ones and zeros. At some point, these signals are going to meet, okay, and they're going to be corrupted, but they're not going to be detected, of course, until B's signal gets to A or A's signal gets to B. And that will happen, okay? 
So A, how is it going to detect that a collision has occurred? Well, think about what's happening. It is the NIC, of course, that's putting out the ones and zeros on the line. It's able to detect or test at the same time. I put a one out, what's the line state? It's a one. I put a zero out, what's the line state? Zero. Fine. It keeps on going like this, everything's cool. Finally, though, B's communication gets here, and A goes, I put a zero on the line, the line state's one. Okay? A collision occurred. Collision detect. So what actually happens is each computer will recognize this, and even, even if it takes some time for B to recognize it, it will recognize it, and it'll back off. It'll stop communicating, stop transmitting, and back off for a random amount of time, random number generator. So say A backs off for 10 milliseconds, B backs off for 20. 10 milliseconds, A will wake up, carrier sense, is anything out there? No, and transmit. And quite likely, the transmission will be done before B wakes up and tries to transmit too. Why? Because network communications are what we call bursty, okay? B-U-R-S-T-Y. So they occur in short intervals with high amounts of data, but they don't take, take long. So A will um, get its signal off. Now, this will be tweaked too, okay? If I'm, I still have a lot of collisions or network thrashing, so to speak, then I may adjust the back off interval, okay? I may have a station back off for considerably more time. Now we can see what happens though with scalability. Remember quality service, fault tolerance, security scalability. As I start adding more and more stations to the bus, the likelihood, okay, the probability of my collisions goes up. And this is what happens. If I put too many stations on here and I, I can, it can result in network thrashing, because now I just have this endless cycle of a computer trying, it sees a, you know, a free state starts to transmit, but someone else starts to transmit. So I just have these computers backing off and trying to retransmit. So there are numbers out there that determine how many computers you can actually put on a bus over a certain length of time. And we'll leave that to, again to the system and network administration program. <clears throat> okay, now the next protocol, and this is the ubiquitous protocol that is used everywhere. Internet, extranet, internet, local area networks, okay? TCP, IP. Um, and I just use no local area networks there. Local area networks will use both TCP, IP, but when I look at, say, a local area network that, that's just confined to a switch, a switch is a physical address, and I, I will get into that at this point. Okay, so TCP, IP. Um, it's the transmission control protocol internet protocol. Quite often you'll hear this referred to as the TCP IP stack. Why? Because it is a stack of protocols, okay, and here's the complete TCP IP stack. The top level I have my application protocols, okay, SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol, even though it's SMPT. HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol, that is used of course by the World Wide Web. FTP, Telnet, okay, SSH would reside up here that we use for our Linux labs, okay? Um, and again, recall that TCP IP is built into the operating system. Below the application layer is the transport layer, okay, both TCP and UDP, and UDP is used, um, followed by beneath it the internet protocol, the network layer, and then the media access is comprised of kind of two separate sub-layers, the data link and the physical, okay? So what actually happens, just to give you an overview before I go back, is information is passed down the application layer and it's broken up, okay, successively. And you don't need to know this, that the transport layer is broken up into segments, passed to the internet layer, broken up into packets, passed to the physical layer, broken up into frames. These frames are actually put out on the internet, on the network. They go to the destination and then they're reconstituted from frames into packets, into segments, finally into the application layer data. To give you an example, my, my too often used ESPN.com example, I request a web page from ESPN, okay? So here's ESPN, computer A, it's the server. And they're gonna send me a web page, okay? And I won't go into the three tier stack that is ESPN. But say they have an HTML page and they're gonna send it to me, okay? At their application layer, the web server layer there. It gets passed to the transport layer. It gets broken up, 
let's just say it's broken up into two segments. Each segment will have a header and a trailer, okay? And it'll have a destination address, a source address, things of this nature, um, but also have numbers that will sequence it, okay? Or put so that it can be reconstituted. The segment will be passed down to the IP layer, okay, where it'll be put into packets. And again, each packet will have a header and trailer. So if I looked at that packet, okay, it has packet information, but it also has encapsulated in it segment, transport layer information, and then it'll get passed down to the physical layer. It'll go out on the network, it'll reach my computer. My computer will start grabbing these frames, forming them back into packets, pass the packets back up to the, um, to the, the transport layer, get formed into segments. Finally, at the application layer, I'll have a HTML page that my browser can now render and present to me. So that's the basic, um, what's basically happening with the communications. <clears throat> now, I wanted to cover something else. Here are, by the way, I did include the TCP IP headers um, for the, of course, TCP and IP. Should you want to look at them, this is the information that goes in front of every IP or, TC or TCP segment or IP packet. Um, and, in, and again, in the, um, if you're using, you know, Packet Tracer, okay, you can actually look at this information, source and destination, other information. Um, if you do the Kali Linux final project, you'll be able to look at this information. Because again, this, this is not only, Kali's used not only for um, security, but network diagnosis. Okay, now, I presented, I probably shouldn't be, showing this slide yet, but um, recall what I said about synchronous communications, okay? We have synchronous and asynchronous communications. And I mentioned that the book is kind of misleading in that it leads to, you to believe that synchronous communications, I know when that next packet is arriving. It's not the case. I don't know it's arriving at 12.01 with 30 seconds, okay? All I know really is that it's arriving. What does synchronous, if I know it's arriving though, what does synchronous communications require? It requires connection management. If I know something is coming, okay, I have to establish a connection. How do I establish a connection? Okay, let's look at it first generically. Pardon me. <clears throat> Imagine, if you will, three ast two astronauts in space. How would they set up a communications channel? Because they can't see each other, right? So I'll use the example of Tom and Betty. Okay. Tom will start. Betty, this is Tom. Do you read me? Okay. So if we just look at that message itself, what did we have? I had a source address, a destination address, and a message. And what do we know about the system? What do the parties in the system know about the system at this point? All that Tom knows is he sent a message. That's it. It just went out there. When Betty gets the message, okay, she now knows that Tom's there, so she's going to reply. Um, Tom, this is Betty. I read you. Okay. Again, implicit in that message was a source and a destination. Now what do we know about the system? Well, Tom knows he sent a message. Betty knows Tom is out there, and Betty knows she sent a message but she doesn't know that Tom received her message. It's not until the third part of the handshake, three-way handshake, that Tom responds, hi Betty, this is Tom, yes, I read you as well, or whatever, okay? So to set up a connection, connection management, synchronous communications requires connection management. Connection management requires a three-way handshake. Now to get us thinking in computer terms, how could we do this in computer or network communications. This is done by the TCP layer. The TCP, the transport control layer, handles connection management. And it does it through sequence and acknowledgements. Sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. And it's expectational. And I'll define this in just a minute. <clears throat> so computer A is trying to communicate with computer B. So it sends computer B a message. Now in this message, of course, would be that TCP header and trailer and packet header and trailer. We don't need to focus on that. We're just focused on the, generality, the generalities here. 
Computer A sends a synchronization request with a sequence number of one, and it just, it just generated this randomly. It could have been 997, okay, 2000, whatever, okay? Just, it selected one here, just randomly. Computer B will respond by generating, again, its own random sequence number, an acknowledgement that is expectational with respect to that first communication sequence number of one. Because what it's saying is, in its acknowledgement, I acknowledge two, which really means the next thing I'm expecting from you is two. Because implicit in that, if I'm expecting two, I can infer computer A knows it got number one, right? I expect your second packet because the convention is, okay, I'm expecting two. Well, you can now know that I got one. So now for the third part, what's actually happening? Sending sequence two, but what is the next sequence it's expecting from computer B? Well, it's expecting it, it's sending it in its acknowledgement 101. My acknowledgement 101 means my next sequence I expect from you is 101. So it's expectational. Now, why was this done? Well, it would be really slow if we tried to communicate packet by packet, okay? Sending one packet at a time. We send windows of packets, okay? And this also is set up, and I won't go into it, in the TCP connection management. It depends on the link speed, the speeds of the computers, the servers, all of, all of these things. So typically, when I send something off or I'm setting up a connection with ESPN, okay, it's going to send me 100 packets, 500,000 packets at a time. This expectational nature will actually provide me with reliability. Why? Think about this. ESPN is sending me my web page. Let's just say it's 100 packets, right? They say it sends the 100 packets. I get packet 1 through 49 and then 51 through 100. Somewhere out on the internet, it lost packet 50. But because of this expectational nature mechanism built in, all I need to do is send back to ESPN of my acknowledgement 50. Because it gets back to ESPN, and ESPN doesn't even have to think. It's expecting packet number 50. I'm resending 50. That reliability, that ability to overcome lost packets is built into that expectational um, nature of this protocol with very low computational costs. Expectational. Okay, so any lost packets, you lose a packet, resend it. It's in the acknowledgement. Now really what takes place, ESPN isn't even going to assume that you got 51 through 100. You, you send me a acknowledgement of 50, I'm going to start, I'm going to send you 50 through 100 again, which makes it very easy for the client computer too, because anything after I got 1 through 49, who cares? I'm missing 50. I'm throwing those away. I'm waiting. I'm going to get from 50 on and continue on. So this way, even if they're, no matter where the holes are, I can continue to build that page and represent it and present it. Okay, so there's some other technologies here. Some I'll cover. Some I'll just let you read about. Um, power over Ethernet. Power over Ethernet is important. Why? Because organizations have gone to VoIP phones throughout their organization. Why? Their cost benefits, there's rerouting. I can have offices all over the country with a single phone uh, prefix and route them. I can move people around an organization and dynamically route their phone calls to them. So it so really does pro provide flexibility and agility. The problem comes from, well, as soon as you go to a VoIP phone, which is a computer, okay, voice over IP, these soft phones or whatever you're using, they do require power. What happens if power goes out? Well, some organizations, they could probably tolerate, what, what about a hospital? What about a school? Okay, the phone systems have to work at all times. So power over ethernet provides you the ability, should your power go out, well, I can still provide power over Ethernet. Now, of course, it'd probably require a generator, but it doesn't require a lot of power. So I can provide power over Ethernet to that device. So we're seeing this. It's, it's great for, you know, um, phone systems. But we're about to see its application in the Internet of Things. And that's, that's the next thing. And we're actually going to start talking about that next week. 
that's again it's exciting but there are major security and privacy concerns that we need to be aware of um, there are protocols and standards for using other types of wiring you know phone lines power lines um, <clears throat> Broadband over power line is, is kind of an exception here, I'm going to say, um, because it is has it has its uses. Um, you know, I, putting your communications in home, communications on your phone line, you can do it. Um, how secure is it? Can it be read outside the house? Same thing, power line. You start putting your communications on your power in your house. Well, it can be read outside your house. Um, power line. Power lines are not a great mechanism. Why? It's carrying electricity. Electricity is just inherently noisy. So you're going to have bit rate errors. Um, God forbid some turns on a hairdryer in your house when you're downloading a file. You know, there goes your download. Um, it's getting better. I, I do acknowledge that. Um, will it ever take the place of Ethernet or wireless? I, I don't see it. Broadband over power line, it kind of is an exception. Again, power lines inherently noisy so you're not going to do any high capacity high speed communications but if you look at some control shack out in the middle of north dakota hundreds of miles from anything what are my options i can lay cable there that's real expensive right i could do something with satellite that's also expensive on a recurring basis but if it's just low bandwidth needs, I could use power lines and communicate over the power lines because they're there already. If this little shack has whatever it is, you know, it's a little outlier for monitor, monitoring something. So that is, that is an option. Um, Wi-Fi, again, I'm not going to talk much about Wi-Fi. Um, hopefully within a week or so, if I, if I get an extra moment, I'm actually going to configure a Wi-Fi router for security. Um, and I know everybody secures their routers, but they're, I've almost never found that anyone secures their router entirely. There are a couple extra little steps that you can and should take to secure, secure your router. So um, note it's a Mac and physical layer specification. It's half duplex. OK. Um, the book is kind of dated. 802.11ac is now the fastest. And there are many, there are many new um, technologies, too. Um, you know, actually, we just talked about the just introduced to the first tri-band um, rather than dual band. Um, anybody up on the new smart beam technology? You read about that? It's kind of interesting. Um, in, in newer routers, they're now deploying or using smart beam technology. Um, so the newer routers with three or more antennas are actually able to triangulate your position. They're able to determine what direction your tablet is, your phone is, your TV, smart TV, whatever. Because now they can beam the data so they can actually separate it out. Three people in three different rooms, okay? I can now put, you know, push data in a direction better and keep the communication separate because of the separate computers. Higher bandwidth, things like, things like that. Okay, that's great, you know? I can now have seven people in a house and they're streaming media and there's, there's less conflict. Um, however, anything we create can be hacked, okay? So again, if someone hacks into your router, and I'm just speaking hypothetically, um, will, it come, will we reach a point now someone ha can hack into your router and know where you are in your house because of the smart beam technology? And this is the way we have to think, okay? Great application, wonderful, improves communication, how can it be subverted? So just keep these things in mind. Um, WiMAX, WiMAX, you know, has been around for a while. It's, you know, began, the, the specification began, I think, in the late 90s. Uh, WiMAX is in last, is a last mile technology, which means it directly, it would directly, and it does directly compete with, say, Time Warner, DSL, things of this nature. Essentially, it is a, Wi-Fi on steroids, okay? Um, and again, there are health concerns there, as, as I've pre presented. Um, and WiMAX is here. I think it's, um, and locally, it's clear channel. You can buy these devices. Um, and they're, and they're, they're kind of nice. Um, WiMAX can have a range up to, I think, I think 50 miles if it's direct 
uh, point to point. But typically, typically they can get, you know, a radius of two to six miles. You can buy one of these clear channel devices. Actually, the department has a couple. And it was very cool. Um, I went to a conference down in, um, and it will connect using, say, Verizon or something like that, but then it will provide you with your own two to six mile radius. So I was at a conference down in Orlando. I could bring this thing, leave it in my room, and send all my communications through that. I essentially have my walking, you know, broadband station. Um, so I never have to use the hotel's Wi-Fi, which of course sh should alert us, or at least we should be aware of the security risks, things of this nature. I'm on my own private channel. You look at, say, this, you know, hot zone radius of two to six miles, you think about, you know, New York City. You know, you just have, say, an attorney in New York City, you know, working in their office. Well, they can go out to the street, they can go out for coffee, things like this. They can remain probably within that two to six mile radius and just continue to use their own private little network, which is very cool. Um, so WiMAX is here. Um, last mile competes with DSL and, and Time Warner. Um, never really taken off. Um, not sure why. So um, other things taking place. Um, and these are some of these, you know, again, we're pushing the limit on all of these technologies further and further. You look at Bluetooth 4.0, range up to 200 feet, 24 megabits per second. Again, the small b is the bits. And also, by the way, as soon as you see that, you should remember, you know, we have parallel versus serial communications. Most communications outside the computer is serial. So when we look at Bluetooth, we know it's a serial by that megabits per second. Um, or at least it should remind us. Um, range of 200 feet, it's kind of cool. You know, you leave, your phone in your gym locker and go out anywhere within the building and you're pretty much connected via Bluetooth. You don't have to carry your phone with you. Um, so kind of cool. Uh, Wi-Fi Direct kind of competing with Bluetooth. Um, same thing because it's now point to point. No router access point is necessary. Um, and you're seeing Wi-Fi Direct now in um, pro audio communications. So wireless stage monitoring, wireless microphones, things of this nature because Wi-Fi you know, you look at the latest Wi-Fi standards and the bandwidth is through the roof. To some extent, it's almost greater. You get better fidelity than copper, you know, guitar cables, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of these other, uh, I'll say, niche technologies. You know, they're out there. Whether they'll ever get market adoption, I kind of doubt it because they're just, again, they're niche. Zigbee, Z-Wave, I'm not going to talk about them. Um, Network adapters. So I did introduce NIC network interface cards, and they house the physical MAC address. And increasingly next week, we'll really look at the distinction between the physical MAC address and the logical, say, IP address, or the URL, which is even a further extension of a logical address because it has to be translated to a logical address. Um, of course, it's done by the domain name server system. OK. We understand or should understand is everybody's pretty familiar with modems, modulators, demodulators that convert between digital and analog signals. And we use these, of course, we have our cable modems, you know, our DSL modems. Uh, interestingly, what, and I don't recall, I apologize, as it was present, if it was presented in the text. When we look at DSL, um, because again, DSL, it's using the, the phone lines they do need to also distinguish between typical phone calls and the computer component that's being used or the, the, the data that's being sent on the phone line. And how do, how do they do this? Well, when you look at the bandwidth of a twisted pair and you look at the bandwidth, the frequency range of the human voice, human voice takes up a very small segment of that actual frequency range that can be carried on a twisted pair. So of course, if you, anybody here is, who's had DSL? A few people. You had those extra little connectors that you had to do would be filter out and only present the, within the, the human voice range to the phone, everything else would be filtered out and would be reserved for the data network. Okay, so that's what those, those were, those little um, frequency filters there. Um, we should know a bridge. Just, just for terminology now, bridge connects two lands together. Easy to, way to remember this, think about our road system, okay, bridges. What do they do? 
Well, it's very, typically the bridge connects roads that are kind of equivalent on each side. You know, if there's a two lane highway, the bridge is going to be two lane. It's going to connect to a two lane highway. If I have a three or four lane highway, typically the bridge is three or four lanes, connects to a three or four lane. So a bridge connects two lands together, okay? In contrast to a gateway, which will connect two dissimilar networks, okay? So if I go from fiber optic to, you know, copper cable, something like that, I'm going to need a gateway. Um, Multiplexers, well, here's the textbook's um, definition of a multiplexer. Um, please recall, though, my definition. Um, multiplexing allows us to create multiple logical resources from a single physical resource. So in terms of networking, if you look at, say, the Internet backbone, you have a single fiber, you know, it's more than a single fiber, but look at one single fiber cable. It's not just carrying one communications, right? It's carrying multiple communications between multiple sources and destinations. So I have multiple virtual connections on a single physical fiber optic cable. So multiplexing again, creating multiple logical resources from a single physical resource. We see that just on our computer here. I have a single ethernet port, you know, that I plug my ethernet cable in, right? But I have a browser open, maybe two. I'm running Chrome and Safari. I have my email client open. So I have multiple logical connections using that single physical connection. So that's multiplexing. So that is it. Um, next week gets real interesting when we really jump into the Internet of Things and things like that. Um, that's it. Have a great week.